you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke chapter 24. Because I still want to have you convinced that salvation has always been by grace. Because if it ever has been by works, then why couldn't it be by works now? And works, our salvation that depends upon our works and how we live, then it brings a lot of insecurity, a lot of questions, a lot of doubts. And a lot of people become very worried because they're not at peace. Because any time that your salvation depends upon your good works, you all have questions about your good works. Because you're the only one that can wind up judge and say, yes, I am doing it or I'm not doing it. And then you become the judge of your own salvation. Not good. That's why we want to trust the Lord and what he's done. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after his resurrection. He came back from the dead. And uh, he was walking on a road. And there were some two guys that were walking on this road. The road to Emmaus. And I want you to look there in your Bible to verse 25. Verse 25. Jesus comes along and he talks to these two individuals. And says in verse 25. Then he said unto them. O fools. And slow of hearts to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. So evidently whatever Christ did. His death, his burial, his resurrection and the why. Was supposed to be understood. By the prophets that had already lived and preached and wrote it in the scriptures. So they were supposed to believe the scriptures. He says in verse 26. That the Old Testament saints, the prophets, they were supposed to believe them because it says in verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ was taught in the Old Testament by the prophets. And why were they so slow of heart to believe? Because that's all they had to do was believe. Because they were looking forward to the day the payment would be made. And the sacrifices that were made was simply a way of showing that something innocent had to pay for someone that was guilty. And it all pointed toward the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And then it says in verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he has to be in those scriptures. I would venture to say there's many things throughout the Old Testament scriptures we have not discerned yet, but are there. I would love to sit at the feet of Jesus and have me, him teach me the book of the Old Testament. It would be eye-opening. And that's exactly what happened to them. Their eyes were open, and they saw, and they understood. Now, also here in these scriptures, I want you to look in verse 44. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. What was he supposed to fulfill? Well, the Old Testament scriptures. And they were being blessed out because they didn't believe what the prophet said about him. And then he says, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? So evidently Jesus Christ is in the scriptures. And they were supposed to know these things. Now, you remember, of course, they're in the book of John. Chapter 3. Well, you're just a couple pages away, so just turn to your right a couple pages, and you'll be, lo and behold, in John chapter 3. And here's a teacher, a Pharisee. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus says, I am impressed. No, he says, you must be born again. <coughs> And then he didn't understand what he meant. You mean i got to get back in my mother's womb and be born again? Now, you would think an older man would have had a little bit more sense than to say that. But that's what he said up there in verse 4. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus says, That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's your first birth. 
And that when you're born of the Spirit, the Spirit, that's your second birth. So there's a spiritual birth that he's talking about. And so he says on in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? So Jesus says to him, Art thou a master in Israel? In verse 10, And knowest not these things? So evidently, Jesus expected this man to know and understand these things. So as he explains to him what it means to be born again, he goes down to verse 14. Look in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now what is Jesus doing here? He's going back to the Old Testament scriptures. What's the purpose of going back to that Old Testament scripture? He is explaining the gospel. Because there is a story there about everybody who had been bit by the serpent. Well, they're going to die. And they put a, a serpent, brazen serpent, upon a pole. And whosoever would look, would what? Yeah. Would live. Look and live. And that's all they had to do. Look and live. Even so must the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, must be lifted up. So you see, there's not a separate gospel here. There's not another gospel and I listen to a lot of preachers on radio and, you know, and articles that I get and how people were saved by the law in the Old Testament or some other way, you know. And they'll be saved a different way during the tribulation period. Mankind can only be saved one way, and it's by grace and it's by trusting Christ and that alone. So the scriptures teach that and makes that very clear. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts in chapter 2. This is the very next book to your right. Because this was um, something that happened right after Christ was crucified. He was raised from the dead and ascended back into heaven. And so Peter is now preaching. But he's preaching to the Jewish people that had come there because of this special Passover day. They're having the Pentecost. And you're talking about, you know, people coming from all these different nations. They spoke different languages. And so... Um, Yes, they had the tongues of fire. But look in verse 22. And notice the content of his message. This is Peter, the prophet of God, who was preaching, he was an apostle, to the people after the resurrection of Christ. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding the bed. So death could not hold him down. Jesus Christ came, was crucified by the hands of sinful men, and but by the foreknowledge of God. Did God know in advance what mankind was going to do to the Son of God? Of course, he's God. Did God already know what they were going to do to this lamb? They were going to slaughter this innocent lamb. Now, so that you know that God, from before God ever made the first man, God already had a plan. But now notice what it says in verse 25, referring to King David who lived under the law. And now here's Peter and he's preaching. Now he can't refer to the New Testament scriptures because they weren't written yet. So he used the Old Testament scriptures. And see what he says in verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Who is him? That's Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. David saw all of this in the Old Testament 1,000 years before Christ came in the 16th Psalm. And then he says here in verse 28, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. 
That's life is eternal life. You have made known unto me the ways of this eternal life. So did David know how to have eternal life? Yes. Read the 22nd Psalms. And the 22nd Psalm that also talks about the resurrection of Christ. It says, and shall be proclaimed by the people that shall be born. So Christ, when he suffers, not only pays for the sins of those up to him, but those who are going to be born after him. So that payment he made was for all sin of everybody, and everybody must need Christ. No man gets to heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says there in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, that through his loin, David, get this, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, the Messiah, to sit on his throne. Did David know in advance that the Messiah was going to come through his line? That's what it says. And... In verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of who? David knew the Messiah was going to come from his line and was going to be crucified and going to be buried and come back from the dead. And when you read the 22nd Psalms, it describes the crucifixion. So this Jesus in the Old Testament, did they know about Jesus Christ? Yes, he was the Messiah. And it talked about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And many of the Old Testament prophets, they studied the scriptures to see when is this going to happen? Because is there going to be two messiahs, two comings, or what's going to happen? They didn't know. And so they were confused. And so when Jesus Christ came, he came to suffer as a lamb. The next time he comes back, he comes back as a lion. And so... In the Old Testament, did they know about the resurrection of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ? Evidently, they did. So I believe these things are important to note. Now, take your Bible and look there in your, I should say, take your notes. A few things I wanted just to read to you, because this is still in defense of the gospel message that we have. We should believe that the gospel that God has given to us is not a new gospel. It's not a, you know, after the resurrection, that's a new gospel. That's not a new gospel. It's the same gospel they preached in the Old Testament. Mankind can only be saved by faith in Christ. Now, in the bold letters that I have there, if they could not be justified by the law now, in the Old Testament or New Testament, and they could not be justified by the law then in the Old Testament, then how were they justified? If you could not be justified by the law today, and they couldn't be justified by the law in the past, then how could they have been justified? If you can't be justified by law, there's only other, one other way they could be justified. And what would be that way? It would have to be by grace, wouldn't it? I want you to hold your place where we are here. We don't have to hold your place. Just turn over there with me and look in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter and chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to, just to look at this verse here. I believe this is important because uh, this kind of goes back just a little bit to the time before the flood. But notice something here in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sin. How many times is he going to suffer for sin? One time. Why does Christ only have to die once? Because man only dies. It's appointed to every man wants to die. Because man only dies once. So he says, the just for the unjust. Now who's just? Well, that, that's the Lord. Well, who's the unjust? Well, that's the people, right? You could assume that's us. Get this. 
that he might bring us to God. So why was Jesus Christ suffered for our sins so that he could bring us to God? That means there was no other way to bring us to God. We couldn't get to God. And then he says this, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. Well, when once the suffering or long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. And so I uh, just want to bring this point out to you. Though Noah preached, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. Evidently, Noah was also a preacher of righteousness, or Jonah, uh, not uh, Enoch. And so it says that in the book of um, uh, Jude. And so we have the New Testament telling us about these people that lived at that time. So they preached the gospel before the flood. And those who were sometimes disobedient, in other words, they could have been unbelievers, hear the gospel and believe. Now, just because they were given a, 120 years to preach and only eight got in the ark didn't mean that there could not have been other people that had trusted Christ as Savior before the flood. And when they died, they could not go to heaven because the sins hadn't been paid for. So they went on the layaway plan until the payment was made. So they were, I believe, in a place maybe like paradise. So when Christ, Christ told the thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So his body was in the grave, but Christ went to the place of paradise. And when he went to paradise, he took these people that were before the flood. See, just because there's going to be a flood, God still showed his mercy, and there could be many of those people because I believe Methuselah could have been a believer. Enoch was before the flood. He could have been a believer. Probably was. And many of those people but they could have died before the flood. But I don't believe they were alive at the time of the flood and got killed by the flood because the Bible says the world came in upon the, the ungodly. So I believe that um, they had to believe in Christ. And this was talking about Christ and the gospel that was preached before the flood. And there's other scriptures that we could take the time to look at. But look there back at your notes here. So I submit to you that the Old Testament saints had to believe the same gospel message that the New Testament saints believe today. The only difference, which is not a part of the gospel message, was their faith was based upon a promise to be fulfilled. And our faith is based on the fact that it has been fulfilled. They had to trust that the payment that was to be made by Christ, the Messiah, was for their sins. They were saved looking forward to the payment that was to be made. And we are saved by looking back to the payment that has been made. On both sides of the cross, grace through faith saves both. Christ is the payment for our sins. Christ is the payment to be accepted. Our salvation rests only in the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's the truth. I believe that's the truth. And I... Um, some people say, well, well, would you like to debate that with anybody? <laughs> no. I state my position. I'm not interested in debating it. The only reason I didn't debate it with somebody is because I think maybe I'm wrong. And I don't think I am. But anyway, Romans chapter 1, these scriptures. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, the gospel of God has to be when he says also, my gospel in chapter 2 of the book of Romans. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, has to be all the same thing. So he says, which he had promised, get this, he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So Paul was preaching the gospel that was promised in the Old Testament about the Messiah. It's not a different gospel. It's the same one. But we're talking about Christ who has made a payment and come back from the dead. And they were talking about a payment that was going to be made. They were looking forward and we're looking back. But both looking to Christ. Look there in the little uh, square box that I wrote here. I submit to you that David's salvation message is our gospel. He looked forward and we looked back. Read these scriptures this way. Paul was separated unto the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
which was made from the seed of David and was promised before time by the Old Testament prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So there's the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, and my gospel, and the gospel of grace, and the gospel of Jesus. It's, it's only one gospel, one good message that can save a person. And that's will you or will you not accept Christ as your Savior. The good news is that a man can be justified by faith. Christ died for the ungodly, that the, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Those scriptures are so clear. But when he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I am not against people saying, you know, well, first of all, we need to reach the Jew, then we can reach the Gentile. You know, the gospel to the Jew first, and then we can go to the Gentiles. So we have to win the Jews to the Lord before we can win Gentiles to the Lord. I don't think so. Or we should witness to the Jews before we witness the Gentile. Uh, no. I don't worry about whether a person is a Jew or Gentile. I just say, you're, you're a person and you've got a soul. I just want to witness to them. Now, I have won Jewish people to the Lord, and I've won some uh, uh, Gentiles to the Lord. And a little bit of everything else, I guess you could say. But notice the next statement. Christ was not here in the flesh to preach a new gospel to the Jews, but to validate the Old Testament salvation message. So when Christ came, he validated the whole message of the Old Testament. And said about telling the same good news, going all over and preach the gospel, the good news to everybody. Because now see, the payment has been made and everybody can have salvation. But they could have had salvation back then. The Jews were supposed to be the light of the world. But they didn't obey. But there's still times when God would send a person to some Gentile place. You ever heard of Jonah? And Jonah wanted to go right to Nineveh. He did want to go reach those Gentiles, right? No, he didn't, he didn't want to go. Now, note the next statement. Is it possible that the phrase to the Jew first does not necessarily mean for us to preach the gospel to the Jew first as we go into all the world, but that the gospel was preached to the Jew first in Old Testament times and that salvation was of the Jews? And that's true. Although God meant for the Jews to reach the Gentiles in the Old Testament with the salvation message, the church is required to preach the gospel to every creature without, without reference to the Jew first. So Peter, he was a preacher to the, the circumcision of the Jews. And Paul was to the uncircumcision, which was the Gentile. But with the same gospel. Does that mean that Peter never witnessed to a Jew? No, everywhere he went, he'd go to the synagogue first. Then after a while, he finally says, okay, you put it from you. I'll just go to the Gentiles. But now get this. The last paragraph, by the way, even Paul, after a while, stopped making the Jew his first priority. If it was a command, Paul should not have wavered into the Jew first. The Lord speaking to Ananias right after Paul was saved. And says, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. It doesn't say to the Jew first. Now, when he talks about in the book of Romans in chapter 1 and verse 16... Uh, the gospel to the Jew first. No, it was to the Jew first. Then he went to the Gentiles. And that's explained even more so in the book of he, uh, Romans in chapter 9, 10, and 11. Where chapter 9 talks about the past. Chapter 10 talks about the present. And chapter 11 talks about the future of the Jewish people. Now look into page 2. Romans 15 and verse 16 says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say to the Jew first. Now, I'm not against missionaries and things like that, saying I, that we should go to the Jew first. They want to do, go, just go to them. Go to anybody. I don't care who you go to. But I don't believe I have to go to the Jew first before we can reach any Gentiles. Because I never even worry about whether or not Wait a minute, are you Jew or Gentile? I don't really care what they are. Go and preach the gospel to everybody. When that was given, it says every creature. That includes Jews and Gentiles. Romans chapter 1 is talking about a historical fact about the gospel did come to the Jew first because salvation was of the Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He told him, says, go not into the house of uh, 
the Gentiles, only to the lost sheep of Israel in the book of Matthew in chapter 10. All right, look there at the next verse. Then Paul and Barnabas wax bold and says, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, look, we turn to the Gentiles. It, you're unworthy because you see you don't believe it when you don't believe the gospel. In Romans chapter 3, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Did the Jews have an advantage? Yes, they had an advantage, but they didn't take advantage of their advantage. Much in every way, because unto them were committed the word of God. They're the ones that had it first. In verse 3, but what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of Christ without effect? Their unbelief does not annul my belief in what God says. Just because somebody doesn't believe what God says doesn't annul my faith in what God says. And it will kill, still happen if I trust the Lord and you don't trust the Lord. Your unbelief ain't going to affect mine. I'm still going to have eternal life and still have, go to heaven whenever I die. Look at the next statement. In Romans in chapter 15, it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Jews, for the truth of God, to confirm the promise. That means to validate, made unto the fathers. God said that the prophets had made a promise, and God made a promise even to Abraham, that God would justify the heathen through what? Faith. Through faith. And so that's what he did. When Christ came, he validated that. There was not another gospel, and you're saved another way. No, he made a payment for the sins of the world by being born under the law, and accepting the condemnation of the law so that people could be redeemed from the curse of the law by faith alone. So the law was to lead people to Christ. I can't save myself by my works. How can I get saved? You have to trust Christ. That sounds good enough to me. And that's the purpose of it. So look at the statement here. And in verse 9 of Romans 15, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this cause will I confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Again, he said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse. And he shall, that shall reign, rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. There's never been another prophet come out of Israel that the Gentiles have ever put their trust in. Except Jesus Christ. But he says that there's going to be a prophet from the root of Jesse that's going to come. And the Gentiles are going to trust in him. Well, if the Gentiles trust in him, shouldn't that be the same one that the Jews trust in? We trust in the same one. So in this last paragraph here, in the middle of the page there, if Isaiah said that Christ was the one in whom the Gentiles would trust, wouldn't it be also the same one that the Jews trusted in? Since this is whom we must believe in, why didn't he include this, that this is how the Jews would also be saved? Because this is what they were already required to believe. The Jews were never told to believe another way, to get saved another way. There was no law given that says you could receive eternal life by keeping the law. There is no verse in the whole Bible that says that. So why would anybody believe that? But the Bible does say, what did Abraham find? That you're justified by faith. God will give you his righteousness by faith. And what did David say? Well, David says, blessed is the man unto whom God will not impute sin. That's grace. So I'll look down at the bottom of the page. And we'll cover this more in the next lecture. <laughs> Must we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to believe the gospel? This great truth can very easily be left out of the gospel presentation, but the mangled message will provide or produce a variety of insecure, doubtful, and questionable saved people. I have preached in a great number of churches that have had many supposedly saved people who had no clue where they were going when they died until they heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Because a lot of preachers are not making the gospel clear. And the death, burial, and resurrection is the foundation for our security. No good foundation, no security. And that foundation that Christ paid for all my sins ought to solve every problem. You see, I don't have to worry about earning my way to heaven because Christ paid for my sins. I can't go to hell why Christ paid for my sins. Where am I going to? I'm going to heaven. How do you know? Because I paid for my sins. Five little words 
and everybody's hurt them, and they don't get it. Left done. Make you want to lose your religion. Look up here. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin. God loves us. Hates our sin, but he loves us. I always want people to know God loves you. You don't like your sin, but he loves you. And the Bible says that to pay for this sin is eternal separation from God because the way of sin is death. So we're all going to die and be eternally separated in a literal fire burning hell. You see, that's why I need to be saved. I don't want to go there. If it was just to be annihilated, I don't guess I could mind that too much. Probably I don't remember anything, you know, uh, 80 years ago. So that didn't bother me none. So if I didn't exist anymore, that's not going to bother me. Why well, I don't exist. But if there's a hell that I'm going to, now that bothers me. So God says he loves us, wants us to go to heaven. And go to heaven, we have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all sinners. So the Bible says you cannot save yourself. Now, how do I know I can't save myself? Well, he gave the Ten Commandments. Try keeping those. Because that's the standard of God's righteousness. Thou shalt not lie. How you doing? Thou shalt not covet. Oh, you're doing real good, huh? And so all you got to do is just be perfect. And so one of the things I used to use in ranch, especially, I'd just say, look, here you are. You're hanging over a cliff. Ten links in a chain. And you're hanging on the last link in the chain. Now, how many links in the chain have to break for you to fall? And this is complicated. I know it's very hard. It's really complicated. How many links would have to break before you fall? How many? Well, you got it right. Y'all are so smart. Okay, does it matter which one? You go, I never broke that commandment. I never killed anybody. Does it matter which one? Doesn't matter which one. One sin, mashed potatoes. It's all over. And we have all sinned. So we've all broken God's law. And the law is something that, it's like a mirror. You look into the mirror and you see what you look like. And lo and behold, when you're looking in the mirror, you see you got cobwebs in your hair and you got turtleneck sweaters on your teeth. You got matter in your eyes. And um, you need a shave, guys. <laughs> and so what do you do? Well, you take the mirror off the wall and wash your face with it. Now, that, that, that the mirror just reveals the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. The law doesn't solve any problems for you and I. It only reveals the problem. We can't keep it. Let's us know we need a Savior. So we go to Christ and we trust Him as Savior. And so when you trust Christ as your Savior, believing that He paid for your sins and came back from the dead. He puts that payment to your account. You go to heaven on what he did for you. So simple. I got people say, that's just too easy. That's just too easy. Well, if he said preach the gospel on every creature, that means even children should be able to understand it. How can it be so hard and complicated that nobody could get it? Because they wouldn't understand it. But everybody ought to understand a free gift. If I offered you this microphone, you accepted you to have a microphone. I offered you my wallet, you have an empty wallet. Christ come in here and offered you eternal life, and you accept it, you'd have what? Eternal life. Well, if it's eternal life and it lasts forever, where are you going to go when you die? To heaven. So can you know you're going to heaven before you die? Of course. That's the best news in the world. That's why it's called good news. Glad tidings. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you're watching by internet, just remember the only thing you have to do is the only thing you can do is would you believe that when Christ died, he paid for your sins, came back from the dead, and all he wanted you to do is believe he did it for you. And he'll give you as a free gift eternal life. And you can go to heaven and know that you're going to heaven because he loved you that much. He said he'll never cast you out and never lose you. Father, we thank you again for this time together. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for our church. And thank you for each person here in Christ's name. Amen.